Welcome to Heartland Vineyard's Message of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message. To learn more about the vineyard, visit us at hvchurch.org. My name is Carrie Metz, and I'm part of the team here at Heartland Vineyard, and it's such an honor to always be uh, here on a Sunday morning with you. I, uh, a lot of times, get to worship with the kids in the back and our teams in the back, and um, trust me, it's a really great place to be. So, But it's just as great to be with you here this morning. Um, let's just, let's just invite the Lord here. He's here, but. So, Lord, I just thank you for my friends in this room. I thank you that we gather because you're such a gracious and good God. And so we just lift this morning up to you. We thank you for crossing our paths. We thank you for the direction that you're leading our church. And we just love you. So, amen. So, today we are entering into the third portion of our series on um, prayer. Two weeks ago, Rodney started us off with um, talking about persistent prayer. And then last week, uh, Boomer was able to share with us about uh, praying with passion and not being. Uh, not being callous, not praying repetitive prayers, but praying with passion. And today we're going to talk about listening prayer, creating space to hear the voice of God. As I was preparing for today, I found myself really not even conscious of it at first, creating busyness, creating chaos. Basically, when I'm on a teaching schedule, things get done around here. <laughs> I start to pull out things of closets. I've cleaned out the shed out back. I was cleaning out files, and really, I was just kind of creating chaos. But sometimes I think, hey, we need this closet clean out. Let's get Carrie on the schedule. She'll, she'll get it done. So I found myself in this weird place, and actually, I even took it home for some really unknown reason. I pulled all of the stuff out of my kitchen cabinets, pots, pans, dishes, etc., and I started to paint the inside of my kitchen cabinets. <laughs> Why? My kids are just so highly annoyed with me right now. And <laughs> Nolan would come into the kitchen and he would say, so where's the glasses? Down the hall and to your left, honey. You'll find them. So it, it's been a little chaotic and it's only been my own fault. Um, I know this. I was procrastinating being with Jesus. I was matching the chaos I felt inside with other chaos. And that's often what we do, isn't it? As the noise and the chaos and the struggles in our life intensifies, we match it. We create more noise and more chaos. And for each of us, it looks different. For some of us, it's social media. For others, it's perfectionism, exercise, being around people, not being with people, watching TV, negativity, despair, projects, substances, eating. Chaos can even look like checking out. We find ways of masking the chaos rather than listening to the voice to calm it. And for some of us, those times of chaos where we desperately need to hear God's voice to be in his presence are the times we actually find ourselves running from his voice or even just covering it. Yet instead of running from his voice, today we are going to talk about so classy today, and it's just not working out for me. I can't even find it. Well, here we go, Tim. Tim always seems to be in the back when I'm up on the stage, so he's probably going to start checking the schedule. <laughs> Carry teaching because... Okay, we're going to try... There we go, guys. <laughs> yeah, chaos. We're talking about chaos. So for some of us, those times of chaos where we desperately need to hear God's voice or be in his presence are actually the times we find ourselves running from it or even covering it. Yet instead of running from his voice, today we're going to talk about stepping out of the chaos 
stepping into his voice so that we can go back and speak to the chaos. For those living from the voice of God, there's nothing more powerful and nothing more intimate. And yet most of us, many of us, are frustrated that we don't even know how to hear his voice. So today there's a story in, in Kings of a, a man named Elijah. He was a man who had powerful encounters with God. And as we begin the story of Elijah, we know that he is in deep relationship with God. He has been hearing from God over the course of his life, and things are about to get really interesting for Elijah. So here's the first thing we know about listening prayer. Listening prayer is nurturing a relationship. When my kids were little, and even actually sometimes now, but don't tell them I told you that, they'll just like, I'll be sitting on the couch or, you know, laying in bed, and they'll come in and they'll crawl right up to me. And not for any reason, not for to do something or ask me of something, just because they want to be with me. And it puts a lump in my throat just even now thinking about it, that my kids would desire to just come and be with me. When we think about a relationship with God, we have to think about it in that context as far as a relationship. Listening prayer is not always about receiving something, but being with someone. Sometimes we just need to be with God and just sit there. My uh, kids' grandfather on their dad's side, Mark, when he, uh, was in the de- when he was being delivered, his mom passed away. And so here was this a brand new baby boy, the youngest of four kids, and his dad just couldn't do it. He was so overcome with grief that he wanted nothing to do with this baby boy. And so Mark and his next oldest sister, they went to go live with their aunt, their mom's sister and her husband, and they were the ones that ended up raising them. And over the course of Mark's life, Mark... um, began to write his dad, really desiring relationship with his dad, even though uh, the, the parents that were raising him were wonderful, wonderful people. And so he kind of stopped because his letters would always be sent back. His dad just really wanted nothing, even though his brothers were there with his dad. And so when Mark got married and started having kids of his own, he said, I wanted, it just even became more of a desire holding his baby boy and walking through life with his family. And so he decided, I'm going to just write all of my feelings down, everything of why I really want a relationship with him. And so he did, and really kind of not expecting much. So you can imagine the surprise of Mark when a couple weeks later a letter came back. And it was not just sent back. His name was on it. It was from his dad. And so he took the time to... a microphone here. And so he took the time um, after the busyness of the day to sit down one evening and open up this letter. And as he opened it up, he was confused at first because as he pulled it out, it was his letter. And the only things But yet there was something that had been added to his letter, and it was this. His dad had taken a red marker and circled all of the grammar errors in his letter and then sent it back. It's a huge, extreme example of this. I think that when we settle in sometimes to spending time with God in the quiet, we're afraid we're going to walk away defeated because we're afraid that God is going to get this big red marker out and highlight all of our junk. And that's so opposite of what God wants to do. He wants to sit with us. He wants to spend time with us. We're his kids. He wants to love us. And so we stay away thinking, oh, man, I just can't do this today. I just already feel weary. I already feel discouraged. And yet God is saying, oh, just come and sit with me. So listening prayer is nurturing this relationship with him. 
We have been created, created from our very existence to live in friendship with God forever. This helps us understand an intimate relationship with him. And John 15, 15 says this, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. We are friends with God. Your wants, your desires, your thoughts, your ideas, they're incredibly important to God. So as you sit in front of him, it's not just a request. It's not just listening to all the failures and the, the check marks and the things that you've done wrong, but it's really just spending time with him, nurturing a very, very valuable relationship. So as we move to the story of Elijah, we know that he was a friend of and follower of God, and he spent time in his presence. So we're going to pick up the story in 1 Kings 18, 25. And before we, we start right there, what had happened was that uh, the people where Elijah was sent to, where they, he lived, they were trying to convince the followers of God that, hey, there's this, this new God, Baal. He's actually the true God, and he has been doing all of these things. And so Elijah was sent to show the people that actually that was so false. And so he had met with King Ahab, and he had said, Hey, King Ahab, the Lord told me to tell you this, that there's going to be a drought until the Lord speaks. And then he went to, and this is where we pick up. I'm not going to keep continue. So chapter 18, verse 25, it says this. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, You go first. For there are many of you, choose one of the bulls and prepare it and call in the name of your God, but do not set fire to the wood. So basically there was this showdown between the false prophets and Elijah. Elijah had challenged them to the showdown at Mount Carmel. Like, let's see whose God is really the true and only God. So they had gathered all these people. I think there was like 850 prophets, false prophets. And then there was Elijah. And so that's where we're at. They're on Mount Carmel. So they prepared one of the bulls and placed it on the altar. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noontime, shouting, Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no reply. Then they danced, hobbling around the altar they had made. About noontime, Elijah Elijah began mocking them. Hey, hey, guys, you'll have to shout a little bit louder, he scoffed. For surely he is a god. Perhaps he's daydreaming. Or he's relieving himself. Or maybe he's away on a trip. Or is asleep and needs to be awakened. So the false prophets, they began shouting louder and louder. And following their normal custom, they started cutting themselves with knives and swords until the blood gushed out. They raved all afternoon until the time of the evening sacrifice. But still, there was no sound, no reply, and no response. And then Elijah called to the people, Come over here. They all crowded around him as he prepared the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones, one to represent each of the tribes of Israel, and he used the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. So at this moment, Elijah believes he is the only prophet left. And at one point, and up in, um, at the beginning of the chapter, In verse 21, he calls the people of God together because they were waving between the voice of the culture in that day and the voice of God. And he speaks to the people of God and says, you guys, how long are you going to waver? It says, then Elijah stood in front of them and says, how much longer will you waver? Hobbling between two opinions. If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. Now, these people that he is talking to are not the false prophets, but these are actually people who have been following God. And they were completely silent. Listening prayer is choosing a voice. What voice am I going to listen to? We are so blessed to live in a culture where technology and podcasts and videos and, I mean, you books, you name it, we have access to it. If we want to know something, we can know it super, super quickly. But we need to choose a voice. Even in the midst of all of that, all those things that are so good, the books, the podcasts, the, the teachings, all of that is so good. But 
we often settle for listening to things secondhand when we can sit at the feet of God and hear it ourselves. What voice in your life are you going to let speak the loudest? There's times I let my family speak the loudest. There's times I let the chaos speak the loudest. And God, in his patience and kindness, waits for us and says, let me speak into this. Let me speak into this. And then Elijah in the presence of the people of God, King Ahab and the false prophets, it says he rebuilds and restores the altar of worship to his God. I think this is such a beautiful picture of Elijah's heart towards God. Amongst the ruins, amongst the weeping, shouting, and destruction, Elijah begins to build a place of worship, and it says this in verse 36. At the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed, Oh, Lord, can you imagine? So here we are. It's showtime. The false prophets have already been cutting themselves, shouting, dancing, everything to get Baal to respond, and there is silence. There is nothing. And now it's Elijah's turn. He had called everybody over to his side. And can you even imagine? Like, I'd say, get me the heck out of here. (laughs) Can you imagine? Elijah's like, oh, God, please show up. And so it says, oh, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all of this at your command. Oh, Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. Immediately, immediately, the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and cried out, The Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. So here is the moment when Elijah tells the people to bring all the water that they can find because he's going to make it as difficult as possible for God's fire to burn up everything. It is so interesting. I I, I read this somewhere, and it's so interesting that Elijah is calling for water when they are three years into a drought. If you're in a massive drought, you don't build a trench with water. You drink the water. This was more than just wetting the altar to make it more difficult for God. This was, there is, the, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. This was more than just letting, wetting the altar to make it more difficult for God. There's this beautiful picture of even when we are in drought, even when we are in a dry place, we can't stop bringing what we have to the Lord. Elijah brings to God the very thing they don't have. Why so often when we are in the driest and most desolate of places in our lives that we find ourselves running from God rather than to God? It's it's as if we are saying, I just don't have anything to bring to you, God. I'm worn out. I'm dry. I'm weary. And instead of building a place of worship where he can come meet with us, We just sit in the ruins. Oh, how that breaks our father's heart. So Elijah has this incredible experience with the power of God. The the fire of God came down, destroyed everything. People fell on their faces like, yes, this is the true God. But listen to what happens next. A few days later, Jezebel, the queen, meets with Elijah, and she says this, at this time tomorrow, I'm going to kill you. I mean, by this time tomorrow, Elijah, you're going to be dead. In 1 Kings 19.3, it says, and Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. So here's Elijah, who had just seen God move in such tremendous power, and he then listens to Jezebel threaten him and runs for his life. He stood between, before King Ahab 850 false prophets and stood with the courage of God to call God's power down. And yet this woman says, I'm after you, Elijah. And he flees. 
This is why I love the story of Elijah. It's just so authentic. Isn't it true that we can have this incredible experience with God and then the very next day think, God, I can't hear you. Where are you? Am I even saved? How often we can quickly go back. And so I think Elijah's story just so accurately represents how we live our life. So Elijah's out in the wilderness running for his life and praying to the Lord. And he's saying this, God, just end my life. I want to die. He's so, Elijah's so discouraged. He's done. He's afraid. He's running away from God. He's confused. And then it says this, that the angel of the Lord began meeting with him. So even when we don't have anything to offer to God, he continues to meet us in this place. Now, many people believe that this angel of the Lord was actually Jesus, potentially meeting Elijah. So the angel of the Lord keeps telling him, get up, Elijah, get up, Elijah. I love this because in this place of despair, when Elijah really needed a word from the Lord, the Lord begins to speak and tell him what is to come. God begins to restore Elijah, not only physically, but spiritually in this place. This is so significant because sometimes God showing up looks like fire, and sometimes he meets us in the cave, and it looks like rest and restoration. I can trust that when I'm not accomplishing something for God, that I can still be with him. And it's in this quiet place, in the cave, sometimes in the place of despair, that we hear his voice. Listening prayer is restoration over relief. Psalms 23.3 says, he restores my soul. And just as God began to restore Elijah in the cave, we too can find restoration in this place of quiet with him. The problem is that often we rally around relief rather than restoration. Relief is momentary. It's checking out, numbing, sedating yourself. Power and control is relief. Television is relief. A bag of cookies, relief. Tequila, relief. And let's be honest, relief is what we reach for because it's immediate and it's in within our grasp. Most of us turn to relief when what we really need is restoration. And restoration comes in that quiet place. The very definition of restoration is this, the act or process of returning something to its original condition by repairing it. I long for relief sometimes when I'm in that cave, but I need restoration. And of course, restoration in turn brings relief, but God is the only one that can restore. So here, this picture is of Elijah. He's in this cave after traveling 40 days, 40 nights, running and running and running, and is now standing before the Lord. The Lord's getting his attention. Elijah, get up. Wait, you have a long journey ahead. There's really no place you can go where you can escape God, is there? <laughs> and God begins to speak to Elijah, and he says, Elijah, what are you doing here? And it's not that God is so surprised or confused. It's not that it's like, oh, hey, Elijah, you're here. God knows. But what if God wanted Elijah to wrestle with? Elijah, what are you doing here? So Elijah begins to complain to God. God, I've been serving you for forever. I've been serving you for years and years and years, and yet people are trying to kill me. And the people of Israel broke their covenant and killed all of the prophets. And God, I'm the only one left. So Elijah starts going down this list of this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Just keeps going on. I'm sorry, too. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just can't help myself. <laughs> and as Elijah begins to complain to the Lord, we begin to notice that the chaos wasn't just in his surroundings or in his culture. God leads us out of the noise around us so we can face the noise in us. 
There's a lot of noise around us, but sometimes the greater noise is in us. And only at the feet of Jesus can he so lovingly and kindly take care of us. God, can I stay with you in the quiet long enough for you to restore the chaos in me? Can we? It's hard. A lot of times it feels so counterintuitive. It feels like this is a waste of time. I should be listing out of these things. I should be interceding. I should be praying. And all these things are so absolutely wonderful and asked by God. But then there's these moments where we just sit. And we say, God, can you settle the noise in me? Because I have to go back out into this really chaotic and noisy world. So God then says to Elijah, Elijah, I want you to come and stand before me on the mountain. We might read that and think, well, Elijah was just with God in the cave. He was just standing before God. See, it's one thing when God pursues you, and it's another thing when you start to pursue God. It's almost as if God was saying, I have been pursuing you, Elijah, and now I want you to come and be with me. Come pursue me. Stand in front of me. So Elijah does that. He goes to the mountain. He stands in front of God. And it says in 1 Kings 19, verse 11, go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire there was the sound of a gentle whisper. And in the original language, whisper means silence. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, went out, and stood at the entrance of the cave, cave, And God began to speak to him again. God shows up in the silence. God shows up when we stand before him. It's in this place that we begin to value our relationship with him. It's in this place that we begin to really understand and learn his voice. Someone said, are we so fixated on God in the fire that we're missing his voice in the whisper? There's nothing like a cave experience to bring you into intimacy with God. The fire, it actually pairs in comparison to the intimate encounter in the quiet place with God. Listening prayer is learned and then matured. And just as we saw Elijah on the mountain beginning to, the wind, the storm, trying to decipher what's God's voice speaking, what, and it came in the silence. So we begin, as we sit with God, it's learned. We begin to hear, oh, that's you, God. When I had my first, uh, we lived in a one-bedroom apartment, so Brayden's crib was in our room. And I remember over time, I could start to hear him. I could start to hear movements that I knew that he was waking up to eat or, or needed something. And so I could begin to hear things that I couldn't at the beginning, and so I would know exactly how to respond. And I can remember Brayden's dad at that time would wake up, he'd be like, oh, Brayden slept through the night. And as a tired mom, first time mom, you'd say, which of the 382 times didn't you hear? Because he didn't (laughs) sleep through the night. But my uh, my ears became tuned into Brayden. They started to hear him. I started to know what the movements meant. There's this just such a sweet little story about this bus driver. And she was really struggling to hear God's voice. And she wrote this. I was on the school bus full of jabbering, yelling kids. My son was in the back of the bus. There were 20 rows of children making noise between us. But as I listened in the back, I could make out the distinctive voice of my boy. To anybody else who didn't know him, his voice would have blended into the chaos. But because I know him... I recognized his voice. The Lord then showed me this. That's how you recognize my voice too. Because you know me 
You recognize my voice even above life's noise. God's voice is so distinctive. He promises that we, his sheep, will hear it. The more you pause and the more you listen to his voice, the more you will find that your ears attune to it. You become familiar with it. It just requires our listening. John 10, 1 through 5 says this. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheep fold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep to whom the gatekeeper opens. The sheep, they hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger will not, they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. So when we put the time in with God, nurturing a relationship, spending the quiet time with him and begin to learn and mature in what his voice sounds like in our lives, then we can go back into the chaos and we can still hear his voice because we recognize it. We understand it. We know it. When I was in uh, just a really, really hard place, I, this is actually a pretty embarrassing story, but I just couldn't help but to keep thinking about it. I was uh, driving to some friend's house in Cedar Falls, and I was on 218, and uh, <laughs> I don't know what, well, I'll just tell you the story. I'll let you make conclusions about me <laughs> based on it. But I just was all of a sudden, like, so, like, Lord, okay. I don't know if you've ever set up a conversation like, like that. You have to convince the Lord of something, but that's where I was starting. Lord, I'm in this really hard place. And here's the thing, Lord. You created, like, peacocks. You created giraffes. You created this whole galaxy system and the oceans and all these am amazing, beautiful things. Lord, I really need you to do something. And you guys, if you think I was, like, joking, I was so dead on serious, I can't even tell you. I said, Lord, I really need to make, I really need you to make me beautiful, like, in the next couple months. Like, can you, I really need you to do something for me here. So, Lord, I'm just asking you, please, whatever you can do, like, maybe you could tell me what to do. Like, I literally, the whole way to Cedar Falls on 218, this was my conversation with the Lord. And so, I get to my friend's house, and uh, we're praying, and, um, the, the guy, Corey, <laughs> just looks at me and he says, I feel like I'm supposed to just tell you one thing that has been talking to me, that the Lord's been talking about to me about this whole entire time. And I said, okay, okay, like I am like pumped, like, yes, the Lord is going to tell me what to do and we're going to start fixing things around here and I'm just going to feel better. And he said, hey, Carrie, the Lord just wants to know he thinks you're really beautiful. So you guys think, that's amazing. I should feel so loved. I rolled my eyes. Like, it's like your mom and your dad telling you, oh, you're so beautiful. And you're like, you created me. You have to say that. <laughs> like, it just doesn't work. And I was so irate. I was so mad. So you can imagine the whole way back home on 218, what I was talking about. Lord, if you think that's funny, it's not funny. And I just went on and on. And literally, I could not talk to the Lord for a couple weeks. Is that so, I mean, when I think about it now, I just was so swirling in the chaos and the things that I was asking. And yet I started to begin to miss the peace that I had when I spent time with the Lord. And so I went back to the Lord, and I really didn't know what to say because things weren't changing. And for me, like I had asked them to. And, and I felt... Like, it wasn't that I heard these exact words, but I felt like he was, it was almost like you just all of a sudden, just all this, you just know something. And all of a sudden, I knew that the work he was going to do in me in the cave was far greater than getting some Botox for my wrinkles. 
I know that's so vain, you guys, but it was where I was at. I mean, if anybody wants to give me a birth pack, I'll take it, but <laughs> I knew at that moment that in the cave, God was pursuing me, and I had the opportunity now, was I going to start listening to his voice, was I going to start pursuing God, and was I going to get in the quiet so I could hear his voice to overcome all the chaos that was swirling both inside me and in my world. And it took me a long time to be able to distinguish his voice. Because I had so much going on in here and here and out there. It took a long time. We have a culture right now that we need to hear the voice of God. Morality and a list of things to do and look like this, be like this is just not going to work anymore. People need to hear the voice of God in their lives about the things that they're going through. See, non-Christians, they can be moral people. They can be good people. But we have the voice of God. And so often we substitute for that, for like, if you do these things, I promise you'll feel better. And they feel worse. Because why? Because those things were never meant to be the thing. It was always meant to be about Jesus. It was always meant to be about relationship. And so we substitute the thing and we wonder, why isn't people, why aren't people flocking to our church? It's because that's not working. We're not spending the time with God in the quiet to hear what he wants to tell people, to hear what he wants to tell us. And so what does the church do? We become as noisy as the world, and that's not attractive. People aren't looking for more noise in their lives. They're looking for a voice. They're looking for something that they can't even put their finger on it, and we um, on it. They can't even put their finger on, and we know what that is. <laughs> someone needs a someone needs a nap. And so when we attack our culture with being more aggressive, louder, more this, more that, all it does is it just cancels it all out. We have the power of the voice of God in our lives, and we're not accessing it. I'm not accessing it like I can. And it all flows through our relationship with him. I was, I'll end with this if the worship team wants to come up. This week, as I was thinking about, I was thinking about our couples that are uh, retired or couples that are empty nesters or getting into that stage of life. And I just kept thinking about you all and thinking that I really believe that in the places of your quiet that you are going to start to see things for our church. The first time we visited Heartland Vineyard on Green Hill, an older came, a couple came up to my husband and I, and they gave us a word. It was out of the blue, and it was so profound to me. And they just hugged us. They gave us this word, loved on us, and then they left, and I have no idea who it even was. There's this place that I feel like maybe you have felt like we've already served for years and years and years. We've been through transition. We've been through staff. We've been through this. We've been through that. And I just want to say that I really believe that where you go in the quiet place with the Lord is going to further our church. You are at a place now where some of the chaos has settled down. And so if you think that your time of how you serve the church is coming to maybe an end. I think it's just ramping up because we need your voice. We need to hear what you're hearing from God. And so, friends, I'm going to close with this. Can you imagine a church where all of us are going home and whatever, we're spending time with the Lord in the quiet 
and hearing his heart and his voice for not only our lives, but for the people in our church and those around us. Can you imagine what a powerhouse this church would be? Well, I can't imagine. We, <laughs> we would be knocking the socks off. Not we, but God would be knocking the socks off of people because they would come in here and they would encounter the presence of God and not that they don't do that already, but there would be, the things would be elevated. And so I know just in the last couple of weeks, man, I stirred the chaos in my life because I know that the Lord was speaking to me, Carrie, get in the quiet place. Learn to hear my voice. Don't wait till you're in the cave. It just takes a little bit longer. So, Lord, we just love you. If you're empty nesters or retired or in that age range, I won't make you do anything except, can you stand up? <laughs> Just that. And for those of us uh, that are here, could you put your hands on somebody? just to pray for them. And if we don't have enough people, it's okay, because God is right here. So his hands will. So Lord, I pray for my friends in this room that are standing. Lord, I just ask that you would take away the lie that things are winding down. And you would replace it with the truth that things are ramping up. Because, God, we are so thankful for these people in this room that are standing. That have waged wars, that have gone through the highs and the lows of life, that have so much wisdom that we can't even imagine. And so, Lord, we just ask as a church that we would tap into these people, Father. And, Lord, we just ask that even today you would draw them in like they just could not get away from you, that you would pursue them and that they would begin to find you again and again and again in the quiet place. And, Lord, that you would speak to them in such profound ways for their families, for our church. And I feel like there's someone hear that you feel like you just made a really like your legacy that you have left for your family is not good and I just I think the Lord just wants to tell you today that it's not over it doesn't matter he wants to bring restoration to your family God is so good that way that no matter what has happened he is a God of restoration <clears throat> so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your being with you this morning. In your name. <clears throat>